Welcome back to the JPS podcast and in this episode I am honored to have the people punching peacock triple P as I call him my man from the University of Western Australia Jackson Pios back on the show and for those of you who are unfamiliar with Jackson he is a PhD candidate in exercise physiology competitive bodybuilder and online physique coach and he directed the first randomized control trial investigating the effects of intermittent uh, caloric restriction versus continuous caloric restriction uh, dieting methods on fat loss, muscle retention, and muscle performance in resistance trained athletes alongside the likes of Lane Norton, Eric Helms, and Andy Galpin. So he's a very intelligent dude. And in this episode, we discuss some of the recent controversies surrounding an article Jackson published on the JPS blog debunking some of the pseudoscience of a popular supplement company and their products, ATP Science. To give some context to the start of this podcast, Jackson's article received a significant amount of attention and was brought to the uh, attention of those higher up at ATP Science. And after this article and many of the backlash and support that he got, uh, he looked to begin uh, raising funds uh, through crowdfunding for a study investigating the efficacy of one of the more popular supplements, uh, a fat loss cream made by ATP Science to assess whether the claims they make are indeed supported by the scientific investigation that he would conduct. And ATP have since uh, protested this study and contacted the university directly trying to shut down uh, Jackson's pursuit of investigating this product. And Jackson's University have since been concerned with potential legal consequences and action that could be made uh, if the study goes ahead. And Jackson is here to talk all about it, what's happened, uh, why he feels that addressing uh, supplement companies' uh, claims uh, with the products that they make uh, is indeed a noble and warranted endeavor and uh, how he is going to go about uh, pursuing this study and furthering uh, the investigation of uh, the products made by ATP Science. So guys, I hope you enjoy this episode. Sit back, relax, and have fun. Waiting game, but she's doing right. She's in good spirits. How are you? Luck- lucky she's tough with the new air. Fucking oath. Lucky she takes after her mum. <laughs> yeah. How are you? No, I'm Still good. in love? Um, fuck, man. This, this ATP stuff's getting out of control, though, honestly. Really? Like, yeah, like... So um, they. This is going to be up. on the air. Is it? FYI. Oh, yeah, I, so have at I, it. I bet it. I, we probably got to be careful then. Yeah. Do, do you want. No, nah, great. <laughs> Unleash. Unleash. No, like, I, I'm serious, man. Like, the, the uni are like dropping the hammer with the legal stuff. So. Well. I, I probably can't say everything live that I'd otherwise say to you. Tell me. Okay. Um, so so last, week they, last week they called the uni. Um, Pretty much complaining about the trial, saying that nicotine um, gum in double dropping. Good man. Yeah, but they're, they're two MGs, aren't they? They are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they've they've called the uni. Um, so all all that I'd done was open the GoFundMe page to start like raising the funds for it, and like yeah, I talked a little bit about it, but not the specifics. Like I hadn't hadn't advertised recruitment, hadn't gone any further with that. Um, and so they've, they've called the university um, last week to pretty much try and deter the trial and say that it's unauthorized and that I've been bad mouthing them on social media, like derogatory terms and things like that. And then, um, and that was based, and so like they'd been, obviously they followed me on social media because that they, they've got screenshots and they were like screenshotting like the thing that I said, oh, the ATP called my university um, today trying to get the study deterred. I've uh, started with an article idea we had back in Perth, I think it was uh, in March. And well, eating some noodles. Yeah, I, I was familiar. So to bring the listeners who are probably unfamiliar with what the hell we're talking about now, to bring them up to speed, do you want to discuss, I guess, before the article, uh, why you felt you know the need to sort of debunk the pseudoscience surrounding Um, you know, this supplement and this supplement company, um, then what you covered in that article, uh, and then that will essentially bring us right up to where we are today. Yeah, okay. So um, I think the motive motive for the article itself originated from um, a couple of reasons. One, that consumers 
are confused um, and one that they're frustrated in the fact that um, these big supplement companies who are, who are pushing out these um, new products, um, new product blend, new product blends with, with various ingredients um, and they're making these extraordinary claims, um, borderline on se selling miracle cures, so fat loss, muscle gain, sort of cure-all products. Um, these companies are making these extraordinary statements um, with very little scientific backing and I think um, the consumers um, are frustrated because um, these companies aren't really being checked um, on, on sort of the claims and statements that they're being making, that they're making and they're sort of able to sort of make these these statements freely without anyone sort of reviewing them. Um, and um, so I'd, I'd heard a little bit about sort of the ATP science products um, and so a couple of people on Instagram might, might send me their product and say, oh, what, what do you think about this? Um, it sounds great, um, but, but do you think it works? Um, and that's sort of happened for, for a couple of months. And then I thought, right, well, um, a lot of people are clearly interested in this company. A lot of people are clearly buying the products. Um, it's probably worth me sort of um, having a, a, a deeper look into these products and the ingredients um, in the products to see sort of are these claims standing up um, to the evidence or, or the body of literature. Um, so that was the original motivation um, for the article. And, and in the article, I, I chose sort of four of their main products. Um, and the difficulty with sort of analysing these products is, is they're not single ingredient products. It's not like a creatine monohydrate or, or, or something like that. Um, they might have six or seven sort of active ingredients um, that are supposed um, to be effective or provide benefits. Um, now, with sort of, I, I think I reviewed four, four of their key products and, and some of the ingredients that, that were supposed to sort of have these miraculous um, benefits, some of the ingredients I, I, I wasn't even familiar with. Um, so instead of sort of looking at the product itself, because obviously subcut cream with six ingredients hasn't been tested in a cl clinical trial, so all we can really do is look at the in individual active ingredients in the product and say, okay, um, is there any evidential backing behind the ingredients itself? Um, and sort of the deeper I looked into it, um, I sort of found that um, – the, the ingredients used in these products, and, and we don't even know sort of what the dosages or if they're even effective dosages because they're, they're proprietary blends, that the, the exact um, doses aren't listed. Um, but in terms of the ingredients itself, um, I found that most of the claims were based on extremely weak evidence conflicting evidence or, or just no evidence whatsoever. Um, and I made that quite clear in the article and, and, and I raised some issues around sort of their collagen protein where they where they had um, made statements about um, their, their no way protein having um, superior muscle growth um, effects compared to whey protein. Um, now the issues I have with that is, is that they've um, they've referenced a study that was supposedly completed in, in 2014 or 2015. There was, there was a bunch of studies. Um, none of them have been published, um, and um, I can't seem to find any reference to these studies on the university database anywhere. Um, but my main issue is is the the findings that they're um, uh, the, the findings that they're um, listing sort of on their product labels or in their product descriptions where, where they're showing sort of superior benefits to their collagen versus whey are, are completely um, contradictive to sort of the other studies that we have um, on collagen versus whey protein and other protein sources. Um, now, ATP did a response podcast um, and they, they sort of said that, no, the study exists and, and they sort of passed off the blame a little bit and said, oh, it wasn't our fault that the study wasn't published. Um, it was sort of the people who were running the study, their fault. And th that, that might well be true, but I still have doubts about that study just because sort of the fi their findings are sort of, they don't line up with the other research that we have on collagen protein. Um, and some of the other issues I raised were sort of um, in relation to their, their subcut cream and some some of the herbs um, used in there. They they just don't seem to sort of um, have any real marked fat loss effects. And and the um, International Olympic Committee came out and said sort of some of these ingredients like coleus for scola or for scolan. Um, there's not enough research for us to be able to recommend it as a weight loss product. And and there's just a lot of there's the, the conclusion that I came was that there's a lot of doubt um, surrounding a lot of these products. They may well work. They might work. Um, but if I had to put my money, um, whether it was sort of 
sort of marked benefits and, and that the, the, the claims that ATP Science are making out about these products are justified. Um, if, I, if I put my money on it, I'd say um, it's unlikely that, 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 that the sort of that the results are going to line up with the claims that, that they're making. Um, and, and that sort of sort of planted a seed um, in sort of my mind and a few others that were sort of listening to the fog podcast and, and following the articles and, and things like that and said, well, um, why, why, don't, why don't you run a study? Um, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you do a study um, on, on one of ATP pro, ATP's products? And, um, and I initially said if, if ATP Science were willing to, to fund a study, like I'd, I'd happily run it um, in my lab and, and, and they, could, they could suggest a product that they'd want to test or, or, or something like that. And we'd do, a, we'd do a double blind randomized controlled trial. So it was a really tight study. Um, but they didn't. They didn't really come back um, with me on. They, they didn't really respond to that. Um, so then, a few guys hit me up um, and said, "Well, hey, like we're we're frustrated with these companies making these extraordinary claims that that sort of haven't been shown in, in the science." Well, I, I'd be happy to put a bit of money um, to to sort of um, to fund to fund a study like this. Um, and I thought, well, if if the consumers are sort of that passionate about sort of companies potentially peddling pseudoscience if, if people are frustrated enough to be able to put money then well I, I'm in a I'm in a, a position where um, I'm able to I'm able to help out and I'm, I'm able to sort of contribute to, to not only the, the fitness industry but also able to sort of help consumers and and if we were able to do a study and and let's just say that perhaps um, one of their products sort of didn't didn't show the sort of, sort of these remarkable benefits that they're showing on the label. Well, that would that would encourage sort of a lot more ethical behaviour by supplement companies because because all of a sudden they think, okay, well, we need a little we need to be a little bit more careful with what we're saying because um, we don't know if our products are going to be tested or, or things like that. And and another thing that it would would do is um, it's going to encourage um, and this would probably be the main benefit it was it would encourage a lot more critical thinking by the consumers and they wouldn't just accept these claims that these supplement companies are, are, are saying on face value that they'd be a little bit more analytical and they think well um, it's all great that they say that this product's going to have crazy fat loss um, benefits but how about I actually just do a quick look into the ingredients and and see okay well um, is it likely that it's actually – is there any evidence behind the, these products and ingredients? So, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at. So we're trying to get the study um, underway. Um, there's been a little bit – little a few little roadblocks. Um, um, obviously, um, like ATP Science have accused me of being a little bit derogatory towards them, and I think that's unfair because um, my, my, my statements that I've made sort of – towards the company has, has never been personal. It's, it's been purely based on um, review of the literature. And, and yes, it's opinionated, but um, I think that my opinions are justified with evidence and, and the product for the company. I've, I've purely just set, targeted on the products. Um, and anything I've said about the products is always interested. Um, and I think, I think um, I've, I've made evidence-based statements. Um, so it's they'd have a tough case well I, I find it unfair that, that that they'd call some of my things sort of defamatory or derogatory because I, I don't think that's the case um i think i'm just a scientist at heart and um i'm evaluating a claim and and um it's my opinion that a lot of the claims aren't sort of lining up with the science um so um still trying to push through with the study um it's i'm not sure whether they want the study to happen or not uh, i do get the impression that Perhaps they don't want the study to happen, um, just from that they've been sort of contacting a few people um, with some some sort of some doubts and um, some criticisms of me. Um, but um, I'm in meetings. I'm discussing. Um, I'm, I'm in meetings and having a lot of email um, threads with some of um, the legal teams involved with, with at the university to make sure everything everything's legit. Um, we're f following the code of conduct. Um, 
even the funds are, are being handled correctly from a, from a crowdfunding standpoint um, that we're following due process. So we're, we're, we're making sure we're, we're working towards it. Um, and certainly the study is still alive. Um, we just need to make sure um, when, whenever you're doing a study with, with a big corporations involved that have a lot of money, you just you really got to make sure everything's tight. So um, I think that's what the university's concern is, is just make sure everything's done by the letter um, and that we're not overstepping our bounds um, with anything like that. So that's where we're at at the moment. Yeah, very cool. And uh, for the listeners, uh, the, the article that Jackson wrote uh, sort of debunking uh, some of the claims made by uh, ATP Science will be linked in the description box below. So we implore you to check that out and come to your own informed opinion as to whether or not uh, Jackson was uh, derogatory. Um, and yeah, in my opinion, I thought you went about it quite well. Uh, we obviously had uh, our legal team uh, look over things before we published it uh, because we were obviously uh, concerned with uh, you know potential backlash uh, that might uh, unfold with this uh, type of uh, article. But um, yeah, to be honest, I think uh, it was handled really well. I think you wrote uh, quite objectively and assessed the claims, uh, evaluated them, and obviously used uh, quite a critical uh, lens to you know portray uh, your opinions, uh, which are, in my uh, opinion, quite uh, well established in science. And it unfortunately led to exposing uh, the claims that they make to be somewhat fallacious, and I guess uh, you know uh, not supported by the science that they were using. So uh, to get into that uh, specifically, do you want to sort of address? the claims made by some of their products and then I guess the uh, you know pseudoscience identifying uh, strategies that you outlined and then some of the problems you found when investigating the claims that they made yeah so um, some of the sort of um, characteristics of, of pseudoscience itself um, one of the ones is that um, with generally someone that's sort of peddling pseudoscience, so they'll tend to, to focus on the fringes of evidence. So an example of that would be sort of um, promoting sort of ingredients or, or products that sort of um, are very front edge or new and that they're, they're enticing because they, they seem new and exciting. But the, the problem with that is there's, because they're so new, there's just a lack of evidence on them. Um, and like I said before, there was, um, there was a few ingredients um, in these products that, that I'd never heard of. Um, and, and coming from someone that sort of is completing their PhD in nutritional sciences, um, for, for me not to know sort of some of these nutritional supplements is, is a little bit of a red flag. Um, like I don't say that from a point of arrogance. It's just I keep extremely up to date with sort of um, – statements um, by the International Olympic Committee on, on their supplements and ones that they think sort of have merit, don't have merit, or sort of we don't know yet. Um, and yeah, that, so I, I was, it was quite clear that one of ATP's strategies that, that works quite effectively to draw customers in because um, they, they, they position themselves as sort of a very front edge um, company sort of, sort of in front of where the sort of the current body of evidence is. Um, by using these new products that people haven't heard of and that sound really exciting. Um, another, another technique that, that pseudoscientists will use is um, they'll tend to um, extrapolate data um, to contexts that, that are not appropriate. And I'll give you one example um, for one of the products that I talked about in the review, um, which was their AntV products. And um, one of the main ingredients in that product, which is supposed to have the some of the main benefits um, of the product itself is um, CLA conjugated linoleic acid. Man, I remember, and, I remember taking CLA freaking back in like circa 2010, and I thought it was like, <laughs> man, you got to have your CLA if you want to, you know, lose fat. And man, the amount of freaking money I would have spent on that. Anyway. that that's a that's that's a really good point. Like some a few people have sort of. Um, criticized my my sort of speaking up about atp and their products and they'd be like why do you why do you even fucking care about it like it doesn't matter if they want to like like there's no downside like people are spending a shitload of money on this stuff like mm -hmm. um 
like I saw one of their ATP stacks was like three products was selling. Like this was a sale selling for like two hundred ninety dollars for like a month supply. Like, like people are spending like a massive amount of money that could be spent on on other better things. So when people say like, oh, like why do you even care about it? Like I'd like to help these people because most of the time, like the cum- the consumers who are buying these products, they're, they're just not armed with the knowledge um, to sort of to sort of um, discriminate between fact and fiction when it comes to the claims that the, the ATP are making. Um, and, and if I can help them and, and see sort of, or maybe like, maybe this sort of this $290 stack isn't justified. It isn't going to give you much benefits. If I can save the money and, and like I'd, I'd do that, like that's, that's a motive for me. So um, when people say like, why do you even care about it? Like, the, the 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 financial investment that people are making on this is is, is extraordinary um so going back to um the cla so um i think it was yeah early 2000s um there was a bunch of rat studies where that where they gave them um a pretty hefty dose of cla and there was they saw that sort of the rats that were supplemented versus the rats that were supplemented with placebo um the the rats taking the cla were, lost like something like 40 to 50 percent more fat like we're talking like outrageous more amounts of more fat loss um and so obviously then then we're like oh well humans need to be supplementing with cla for fat loss too um and like that that's that's a reasonable conclusion to make um but when we saw cla um tested um in humans we saw that the that the fat loss effects of cla were absolutely marginal um like almost insignificant um so it was clear that sort of the the there was some sort of physiological difference with the response to cla in rodents versus humans um and it's it's very unlikely that humans are going to get much benefit if any now the what's what atp do The remarkable fat loss benefits um, with taking CLA, uh, and that's just an example of sort of um, them extrapolating to it to an inappropriate um, situation. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's um, not only CLA that these, uh, I guess, uh, extrapolations are made. It you know occurs with quite a number of uh, you know the ingredients within their product, um, and you also found that some of the studies they used to reference certain ingredients didn't exist or you you couldn't find them yeah so they have they have like on their on their website they have sort of product uh, product pages where they will um, explain a little bit about the product and and then they'll explain the benefits um, and then they'll have a bunch of citations below that are supposed to sort of back up the claims and statements that they're, that they're making um, in regards to the product. And, and when I went through the, the reference list, um, there was a bunch of studies that just had no applicability to sort of the product or the, the claims that they're making whatsoever. Um, and and in on some of the product pages, um, I couldn't see any referenced articles in relation to the product that I was talking about at all. Now, this is a massive problem because um, to the general consumer who's probably not going to open up these studies on PubMed and, and give them a, a read through, um, they go through the claims and then they get to the references and they see 20 studies listed and they think, whoa, like look at all the science behind this product. Like this must be legit. Um, and a lot of people aren't sort of, they, they, like, I understand they probably don't have the time to, to look into this sort of stuff. Um, but I, that's, that's a, that's a, it's a quite a shady technique. Um, and yeah, I, I, I have issues with that because, um, it, it feels like it's, um, uh, it's manipulating the consumer. Mm-hmm. It's, it's ethically, yeah. you know, flat out wrong. It's, yeah. yeah, not only a misapplication of real science, um, you know, it's not even focusing on the fringes, it's um, deception, mm. uh, you know, and that's, um, you know, fraudulent behavior, which, uh, you know, would warrant, and, and I guess this sort of uh, leads to ATP science's concerns, you know, if they were to be investigated and found to be deceiving consumers, uh, you know, consumers could pursue legal action um, you know, claiming, uh, you know, some form of damages, uh, you know, if there are 
unjustly, you know, affected by purchasing these supplements. Um, but I guess I'd like to sort of cover what the current situation within Australia is surrounding the regulation of supplements and uh, the marketing claims of supplement companies. Are you familiar with uh, the, I guess, the process uh, and the regulations surrounding that? Not too much, um, but I know that sort of a lot of these companies, um, they get the get out of jail free card by, by putting a little statement um, on their products saying sort of these statements haven't been reviewed by the by the FDA. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that sort of gives them a little bit of free range to be able to um, essentially say what they want. Um, now, the the issue the, the the major issue is um, that that not not only ATP Science but many other supplement companies um, they're making blatant statements um, that have not been evidenced by the literature. Now, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not fully. I, I don't fully understand sort of the legal processes um, behind it. But it all, all I can see is is that. Um, there, there's very little um, the, the, the companies aren't getting checked on what they say um, and it's an extremely unregulated in industry um, and I'm not sure sort of how we'd be able to progress with with more regulation um, I think it would be great um, if and like they, like that's not to say that all sort of supplement companies are unethical and, and sort of trying to peddle sort of pseudo scientific products. Like I've since sort of talking about the, the potential ATB science trial, I've had two supplement companies that have contacted me and said, Hey, like it would be great if you could test one of our products. Like, like we, we, we're confident in it and, and we'd like to see, see if it works. Like independently, they have nothing to do with it. Like they fund it, but they have nothing, they have no control of what the results are and, and, and the findings. Now, now like that, that shows that like there's, there's good people in the supplement industry that like they truly believe in their products and that, that's the way to go about it. That's why, that's why I have a little bit of issue with ATP, not only, um, not only um, not wanting to sort of fund, um, independent tests of their products itself now it doesn't mean, need to be by me it could be any other any other research lab um that would be that'd be great i'd have no issues with that but they're also going a step further to sort of try and throw in a little a few little roadblocks um to to deter a study that mm. that i've been proposing and, and the conclusion that i'm sort of making is well um if they really had complete faith in their products i'm unsure why they'd they'd be so um I, I, I'm, I'm unsure why they'd be so against sort of having this trial trial go forwards. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are good companies out there that, that, that actually like they want to take a sort of proactive step in getting their products tested um, and things like that. But yeah, it's extremely unregulated industry. Um, and unfortunately, I think there are a few unethical companies out there um, and they'll make bold statements that haven't been verified by science. Um, and until we get either more laboratories and more scientists um, testing these products, which is difficult in itself because mm -hmm. you, obviously you need funding and if the company is not going to pay for itself, then how, where, where are you going to get the money for to run the study? Um, so that that's, it sort of runs around in circles a little bit. Um, companies don't want to do it. They don't want to pay for it. So there's no money to do the studies anyway. Um, but what I'm hoping is that um, if, I, if, if the ATP um, study can go forward, um, that um, it's going to encourage more ethical behavior by other, com other supplement companies and then um, they might be sort of more inclined to get their studies because ha like what would be better marketing to sort of have your product tested and show that, show that the, like the claims matched up with, it, with, um, with the results in, in a scientific trial. There's nothing, there's no better marketing than that. And like I, I have frustration in that companies are willing to spend hundreds of thousand dollars um, on sort of these sponsored athletes and, and things like that, but they're not willing to sort of put five thousand or ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars towards sort of actually getting their products itself tested to show that they work. So that's my frustration at the moment, um, as well as the frustration that sort of um, the supplement industry as a whole whole is quite unregulated. Yeah, I, th I think the fact that independent testing of the supplement, uh, you know, could be something that occurs through. Uh, both crowdfunding as well as funding from supplement companies, uh, you know, we'll just hold all supplement companies to a higher 
um, you know, standard. And that's only good for the consumer and the supplement company. But I think the incessant roadblocks and obstacles that uh, ATP Science are trying to put in front of you is evidence of them not wanting their product tested and potentially being fearful of it not, uh, you know, matching up to the claims that they're making. Uh, well, well, at least it seems uh, that way. And mm. I guess, uh, do you want to talk about the study that you are proposing, uh, you know, to test their supplements? Yeah, so um, can't speak too much about it, um, but um, we're, look, we're hoping to test one of um, – one of their fat loss creams um, and um, sort of the trial structure that, that um, sort of we've proposed um, is to be randomized, um, double blind, controlled. Um, now, I've, I've even sort of, I can appreciate the fact that ATP might be of the perspective that sort of Jackson is biased and he's going to want the results to sort of go one way or something, even though like I, I stand with nothing to gain from the results going one way or the other. Um, so the, the double blind nature of that sort of protects against sort of Any that bias, issue. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I've even got sort of, I've got two other researchers who have put their hand up to say they're willing to be involved with the study. Um, and I'm going to make sure that they're more hands on with the data collection itself. And I'll, I'll sort of just see the, the results later on. And I'll, I'll be involved with the manuscript preparation and, and the planning and all things like that. But in terms of sort of administering the treatments, I'm going to leave that up to the other people just so, just so it looks really clean. Um, so double blind essentially means that the participant um, or the investigator um, don't know which treatment um, the participant is getting. So, um, so in just basic terms, an example would be um, for one of their fat loss creams, um, one participant is getting the actual product, um, one participant is getting a sham cream to rub. Um, and then we standardize a diet for all participants. So like, let's give an example, like a 10% calorie deficit. Um, and then after eight weeks, um, we can see we've got an ultrasound. At, um, so we can quite accurately measure subcutaneous um, fat thickness. And, and one of the claims um, of this fat loss cream is, is that it directly targets subcutaneous adipose tissue. Um, so at the end of an eight weeks or something like that, um, we can have a pre and a post and we will be able to compare um, if the reduction – so because they're in a, in a caloric deficit, we'd expect to see um, a little bit of reduction in fat thickness in both groups. Um, but if, um, if the ATP product um, was effective, then we'd expect to see um, a greater reduction um, in thickness um, in the group that's actually taking the, um, the product versus um, the group that's just rubbing on a sham cream twice a day. Awesome, awesome. And I guess what are the potential limitations of this outside of bias, um, you know, dietary reporting, um, all those sorts of things? What do you foresee to be a potential uh, counter arguments to any potential finding, findings that demonstrate the cream is not effective in reducing subcutaneous fat uh, that ACP science could use? What are some of the limitations that they might uh, be inclined to use as evidence that the study was flawed, essentially? Um, they could say we don't have enough people, um, which is sort of the first port of call um, with limitations, which is why sort of this study is predicated a little bit of how much funding we can raise for it, because obviously the more money we can get, the more product we can buy, the more participants, more tests we can run. If you want to fund um, guys, I'll put the link <laughs> in the description box below. I think... We're all good to do that. Is that fine for the crowdfunding? Yeah. We made, yep. yeah, cool. Yeah, the, 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 cr the crowdfunding is the is the thing that's finally got the approval from the university. Thankfully, it was a little bit shaky at the start, but it's good to go now. Um, so hopefully, we can get a, de a decent number of people. Um, recruitment shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then another limitation which I've been thinking a little bit about is sort of the potential for individual differences. Um, like we know that sort of um, people respond differently um, to certain treatments and there's the classic, oh, well, it worked for me, but it might not work for someone, um, which is why I've actually been thinking I could, um, like this this trial hasn't been confirmed yet or anything like that. Um, we still need to get ethics approval and we need to get sort of approval from the Commonwealth and things like that to run a study like this. Um, but what we could actually do is, um, 
potentially have each participant act as their own control. So we could we could switch it up a little bit. So um, everything the same, but let's say we chose like a stubborn area like the hammies or, or something like that for fat, or let's just say the glutes. And um, so we had left glute, right glute. What the, each person rubs their left glute with an active cream. Now, they won't know what the cream is. It would just be in a jar with like letter A on it or something, and it would just be put letter A on your left glute twice a day. Um, so they're putting on left glute twice a day, um, and then on their right glute, they're putting tub B, but tub B is just sort of a vitamin E cream or, or some sort of inactive um, product. They put that on their right glute, and then that would account for any individual responses. So they wouldn't be able to say, oh, well, our product's not going to work for everybody, but it works for some people because it, it's very clear that if sort of if we're not seeing any differences between left and right glute, well then yeah. what would be the the point of taking the product itself? So that that's a potential potential limitation that we could fix up there. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. And I guess uh, you know in terms of uh, your recent uh, I guess communications with ATP Science, other podcasts, um, you know, they've been on a podcast, I believe, I'm not sure if that's been uh, released yeah, yet. It has, yeah. Um, I'll link that in the description box below, I'm going to go watch that. Um, you know, what has been the overall, I guess, consensus, uh, you know, on their part, you know, when they've uh, outwardly spoken, uh, you know, on public forums, you know, whether it's the podcast, uh, social media, you know, we've seen uh, in a couple of groups, um, you know, people from ATP Science have sort of, you know, engaged in comments, uh, you know, when people were sharing your article, um, and they never really addressed anything that was actually said, um, you know, it was very much, you know, dodging and weaving uh, from what I could see, um, you know, but what's your overall uh, consensus of how they've responded outside of trying to, you know, protect their supplement from being investigated, you know, through your research? Yeah. So my number one frustration is that as soon as the initial article was released, before we'd done any podcast or anything like that, um, I said publicly that if ATP um, or their science team disagreed with, with any of the statements um, that I made in my article, I'd happily have a live discussion with them mm -hmm. um, on a podcast or something like that, because I think that would be really good. Um, now, then I had the podcast um, with – uh, it's called Perth Fit Fam, um, and Shout we out spoke. Perth Fit Fam. Yep. <laughs> is Jerry and Lee G is she she in the collective of Perth Fit Fam? Hashtag. Yeah, she, she's she's co-owner of Perth Fit Fam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we did. <laughs> Shout out to Jerry Lee. She, she's going to be wrapped. Best day of life. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we did we did the podcast um, with Perth Fit Fam and and. Um, that went quite public. Now, um, still, I hadn't received any personal um, contact from ATP in regards to anything that I'd, that I'd said sort of in the article or on the podcast. Then what they did was they contacted um, Brendan, who's the owner of Perth Fit Fan, and they flew him over to Brisbane wow. to, do a, to do a response podcast. Now, Damn, I, I my, 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 my issues with that was um, – that they'd be willing to spend money to fly a guy over to speak to a guy who's nothing against Brendan, but probably not qualified to be able to sort of um, analyze anything that was said sort of live, you know, in a podcast. It probably just doesn't hit that no credit, no discredit to him. He just probably doesn't have the scientific knowledge and education to, to sort of um, have a debate with them. Um, and he was, he was sort of just, a, he was being a neutral party the whole time. Now, instead of talking to me, they'd fly him over and, and speak to him. And that, that was a little bit frustrating to me because it seemed, it was sort of like, what's the point if you're not, if you're not willing to speak, speak to me. Um, and I listened to the podcast, their response podcast. And, um, and a lot of the listeners have been quite frustrated um, with it. You can just go look through social media sort of comments and things like that. A lot of people are quite frustrated and they're frustrated because they, they, they rambled quite a bit um, and they probably only addressed maybe 5% um, of sort of some of the arguments um, that I'd made in my article and on, on the podcast. Um, and some of the things they addressed was that um, – I'd referred to one of the ingredients as, as coleus for scoli and they sort of said, 
they they said that oh well if you do a, a search on coleus for scola you don't you don't see any studies but if you do it on its other name for scola there's, there's a whole lot of other studies and that's just not correct um the international olympic um committee that they, they've 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 already done a review on Collies for Scholar or for Scholar and whatever you want to call it. And they've already said that there's not enough research to be able to justify this as a, as a fat loss aid. Um, they also um, nitpicked saying that um, uh, when I referred to, um, when I did an analysis of, of their grapefruit or one of their products that included grapefruit seed oil, um, they said, well, Jackson analyzed um, grapefruit. No, Is that sorry. made by Kai Green? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's the same grapefruit that he used. Exactly. Well, that's why it's anabolic, bro. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I believe it was grapefruit peel extract, and I did an analysis of whole grapefruits, grapefruit extract, and grapefruit seed extract. So they were all because I, I I was I was looking into the studies on this, and I couldn't find any studies on sort of the the, the peel extract itself. So I was just like, okay, what's the what's the second best we can get? It's just the other forms of grapefruit. And they said, oh well, you can't talk about the other forms of grapefruit because ours is different and it's ours is specific to to the grapefruit peel. But there's there's no evidence, there's no science mm. science on, on that ingredient anyway. So that was sort of a moot point. Um, and the other issue they raised, um, which I spoke about before, is in, in relation to um, the collagen studies, um, and I, I spoke about my doubts still about that study. They they said the study does exist and that it's it's going to come out eventually and that, that it's completely legit, um, and that it wasn't their fault that it wasn't published. It was sort of um, the fault of sort of the other parties that were involved, and and uh, that that may be the case. Um, but I'd really like to have a close look at the study um, because I'm unsure why they'd be able to get. Um, such novel results that just don't line up with the other collagen protein research um, that we do have. Right, right. So, yeah, I guess uh, our next move will be to tee up a uh, roundtable discussion with uh, ATP Science and hopefully get you and uh, you know those involved, the higher ups of ATP Science, to uh, yeah have a formal discussion about this and hopefully uh, flesh it out and see if they can uh, you know defend. The claims they make with their products and yeah and and just jumping in like some people have said well uh, having a discussion with jackson would be would be no benefit to atp it would it would be of ext extreme benefit to them if they were able to sort of um substantiate their claims and sort of bring back some some credibility that the consumers are wanting um because at the moment just from looking at the social media comments that there there are some now doubts around some some of these products and um, if ATP were ha able to have um, sort of um, a really logical, well thought out discussion mm. with me, and that, that they'd per perhaps be able to sort of um, pr provide some more info that perhaps I'm missing, or, or some 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 perhaps I'm interpreting the data a little bit differently to them, um, and perhaps they'd be able to more um, effectively so solidify their position. Um, that would be of a huge benefit to, to not only them but also their consumers because it would bring back sort of a lot more confidence to to their company and and, and their buyers. Yeah, I definitely think a lot of people misinterpret like what a debate is versus mm. you know an argument where there's you know insults thrown, you know just. Yeah, poor logical, uh, you know, tactics used to defend an argument. You know, for you guys listening, if you watch any debate, you know, the value for an onlooker is that it affords you guys an opportunity to make a side by side comparison of the validity and, you know, perceived accuracy of both parties' contentions and their position on a topic. And when you witness a debate, uh, you're presented information, uh, you know, obviously. The parties in the debate uh, go back and forth and have a verbal rally, uh, you know, arguing, you know, their contentions and refuting uh, the proposed, uh, you know, um, contentions of the other party. But you can make your own informed decision as to you know, who's presenting the evidence, uh, you know, that that is supported by science, um, you know. And I think uh, the value of these sorts of debates. Not only have we seen them, you know, play a pivotal role in uh, resolving many issues humanity has faced, you know, but they help us develop our knowledge because we can see, you know, where people agree, we can see where they disagree, 
Um, you know, we understand their premises, their assumptions. We find, you know, gaps in what we do and don't know, and it elucidates areas for further investigation and questioning. And I think that is something that you know anyone who values science should be interested in. And given that science is a term used in this uh, supplement company's uh, name, uh, hopefully they value the true meaning of science and not just the use of science. You know, when it suits them. Um, you know, and twisting and distorting it to, you know, uh, use it for their own benefit um, to deceive and obviously engage in potentially unethical uh, behavior. So, yeah, we would love to see that debate happen and we'll hopefully get in contact uh, with ATP Science and Jackson can, uh, yeah, go up against it and see see where, uh, yeah, the differences lie. But, um, moving- Dude, that was dope. We need to clip that. That was, that was fucking awesome. <laughs> We'll clip it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So moving forward, Jackson, what have you got in the works at the moment? We have uh, a study that you, uh, Eric Helms, James Krieger, Martin Rafalo from JPS, and myself are working on. Uh, hopefully, going to uh, be conducted later this year. Do you want to talk to that? And then anything else you've got in the works? Yeah, so um, it's essentially going to be a follow-up to some of the the diet break research um, that we've got going on at the moment. Um, And it's based on the rationale that um, the leaner an athlete is, um, the more potential there is for sort of physiological and psychological benefits from diet breaks. Now, the rationale is based on the fact that um, we know that some of the adaptive responses to energy restriction or, or dieting get more severe as a person diets for longer and as they get leaner. For example, we know that as a person gets leaner, they become more susceptible to muscle losses. But whereas you compare that to an overweight person, sometimes they won't lose any lean mass or, or any muscle losses whatsoever. Um, we also see um, that as a person gets really lean, um, that they'll see sort of the significant um, impairments to anabolic hormone profiles where you compare that to sort of an overweight or or general weight dieter, they start losing a bit of weight. Um, Sometimes actually see improvements in in testosterone and other anabolic markers. Um, We also know that as an athlete gets really lean, they become more susceptible to injury and illness. Um, They become more irritable. Um, their reflexes slow down. Um, so what we think is that um, because the, sort of these adaptive um, effects are becoming so severe, um, there's potential for sort of this influx of calories coming in from a diet break. It could potentially sort of restore the system um, more potently than, than sort of in the context of sort of a person who's only been dieting for a little bit um, and, and sort of perhaps not very lean. Now, um, so if that was the case, then we'd be able to say, okay, well, um, for a person who's just starting their diet phase, who's sort of got a lot of fat to lose, perhaps they might not re- need refeeds or diet breaks right off the bat. Um, perhaps they only need to be brought in sort of the middle of the diet phase or, or sort of to the latter end of, end of the phase. Um, and perhaps that might mean that refeeds and diet breaks become more frequent the sort of leaner the person gets. We just don't know yet. There's, Like I said, there's theoretical rationale, but it hasn't been tested yet. So, so what we're proposing is um, – we're going to recruit um, a bunch of natural bodybuilders um, from different stages of the contest prep. So what that means is sort of some are going to be dieting for a little bit, some are going to be dieting for a while, um, some are going to be sort of not so lean, some are going to be very lean. As we're, we're hoping to get a spectrum. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to put them on a diet break protocol, a similar protocol that, that's used in my ice cap trial, um, which is essentially seven days at predicted maintenance calories. Now we're going to test their resting metabolic rate, um, their mood state, um, some subjective ratings of, of their performance and their recovery at baseline. Then we're going to start them on our diet break protocol and we're going to retest these variables after one, two, and three days at maintenance and seven days at maintenance. Now with that data, what it's going to show us is it, it's going to show us do we see sort of more positive effect in the leaner people? For example, um, do we see greater improvements in mood state? Do we see sort of greater improvements um, sort of in recovery and performance um, in the leaner people when we give them a diet break um, versus sort of the not so lean people? And what it's also going to show us is it's going to be the first study to ever show a time course response um, in relation to sort of some of this normalization um, of these these dieting variables. For example, um, it could well be the case that 
sort of a one day or two day refeed at maintenance is a not enough of a potent stimulus to sort of trigger some improvements in mood or, or sort of sort of reduce stress or, or training stress or, or something like that. But once you get to sort of day three at maintenance or day seven maintenance, maybe we actually start seeing some really significant turn back then. Um, so that we're going to see a lot of really cool stuff um, um, from this study. And we've got Krieger handling the analysis. So we, we know that analysis is going to be super tight. Yeah, and uh, it, it was it, this all sort of stemmed from a discussion we had um, in Perth at the Optimizing Body Composition Seminar, and yeah, it's going to be quite novel, and I think the utility of this study for coaches who are helping people get extremely lean, you know, cannot be overstated. Like, we're going to see, uh, yeah, the time courses for different, uh, you know, metrics, um, and when refeed and diet break strategies start to have you know quite a significant effect on those uh, you know metrics. So, yeah, the way that I sort of perceive it at the moment is you know we're gonna hopefully find out if uh, you know 24, 48 hour refeed can improve you know perceived stress, uh, you know fatigue um, and mood state. Uh, you know, but there's no significant change in resting metabolic rate. We can use that information in practice if we have someone who is just really irritable, uh, you know, they're not recovering well, uh, you know, they might not have, you know, metabolically adapted, uh, so to speak, uh, you know, to the diet. Um, we can just give them a 24 or 48 hour refeed. In comparison, if someone started to see the onset of like metabolic rate uh, slowing down and, you know, they're not losing fat, all those sorts of things, and this study finds that, hey, only after seven days do we see this uh, increase in resting metabolic rate you would give them a seven-day diet break rather than, you know, a 72, 48-hour, 24-hour. So I think it's going to be really useful, uh, you know, for practitioners and athletes. Um, and I'm, yeah, pretty excited to, to see the results. Yeah, man, I'm so excited because there's so many cool things that, that we could potentially pick out here that just haven't been shown before by anyone. Mm. Yeah, very cool. Anything else that you've got in the mix? Nah, man, hands are full at the moment. Hands are yeah. full. Got yeah, I'm, I'm should be should be getting my last participant for my massive diet break study in this Thursday, which means um, touch wood from Thursday should be 16 weeks to data collections completed, which will be awesome. so good because that has been a slog. Man, I'm very excited for you, and I'm sure many of the listeners are looking forward to seeing what you are, uh, yeah, find, and obviously the. Uh, Furtherance of diet break research is only a good thing. One last question I have for you. I'm not sure if you uh, heard Menno Henselman's recent podcast on Revive Stronger. He was asked a question about diet breaks and he essentially uh, proposed uh, that he doesn't utilize them in practice. And I'm paraphrasing here, so don't hold me uh, to, to yeah, a high degree of accuracy in getting his uh, you know, beliefs and statements correct. But essentially, he said that he doesn't use diet breaks because there's no evidence supporting uh, improvements in resting metabolic rate um, and that they often only increase the length of a dieting phase. What would, in a couple of uh, minutes, what would your refutal to that be? <laughs> I'd say just from the presentations that I've given with you, I think we'd probably agree that the studies that I've shown do show some pretty, at least from the studies that have sort of contrasted a period of sort of moderate caloric deficit with a higher feeding period, whether it's a refeed or diet break, at least in those sort of those the protocols that are applicable to sort of athlete diets, I think we'd we'd probably agree that we've seen some pretty decent. Um, sort of benefits with those with those um, dietary regimens and and almost all of the I think I think we have probably six or seven really solid studies that have sort of these mod IR diets so moderate intermittent energy restriction um, probably six or seven really solid studies that have outperformed your traditional continuous energy restriction um, program so I find it a little. I find it a little. I don't agree with it because I think, from analysis of the evidence, um, I think there's definitely merit to sort of refeeds and diet breaks. Um, and like the the Matador study, which had 150 people with two week diet breaks, they they showed they showed better fat loss, less reduction. Um, in metabolic rate, they showed less regain post diet compared to the standard mm. continuous diet. So, um, and that was a really tight study that had a whole lot of funding. So, I, I, I'd have a 
a little bit hard pressed to to agree with him there. Like nothing against Menno, I reckon he's I, a crazy smart dude. He's smarter than me, but I think um, it'd make for an interesting debate and podcast. Yeah, I, and I, 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 um, did, did he did he justify his stance? Like, uh, yeah, he did. I can't remember exactly what he said. He did reference uh, Matador. Um, he was essentially stating that they only increased the length of the dieting phase, um, and that you know for people wanting to lose weight. Uh, it's probably better to adopt lifestyle approaches rather than relying on, you know, diet breaks to help you achieve your goals, essentially. Yeah, like that, that second comment's valid. Um, it's probably, there's a, a little bit similar comment Mike Isretil made on, on a podcast recently where he said, like, it was quite funny. He was like, um, your whole fucking life's been a diet break. You don't need a diet break if, like, mm -hmm. like if, if you're referring to sort of a general yeah. general pop dieter who's potentially not sort of these crazy levels of leanness, not trying to get 6% body fat or whatnot. Um, he was sort of the stance that sort of if you're a normal person, perhaps just you, you don't need diet breaks and that they're, they're not going to have much merit. But I'd also disagree with that from the standpoint that sort of the mod in, the moderate intermittent diets that we do have, which have used refeeds and diet breaks, typically they're not on athletes. Mm -hmm. Typically they're on normal people who are training and sort of sometimes overweight. And, and in those populations, we do see benefits um, with the diet breaks versus the continuous dieting protocols. So, yeah, I'd, I'd – it's tough because we don't have a whole lot of research, um, but I think from the research that, that we do have, I, I disagree somewhat. Um, um, and at least when my trial comes out, sort of whenever it comes out, um, it's on athletes, it's using diet breaks. Um, we should be able to speak a little bit more confidently um, if they do sort of show some benefits over, the, over our standard diet pro approach. And I'm sure at a very uh, surface level based on Obviously, my relaying of Menno's, uh, you know, position, um, you know, it could seem that there's, you know, two polarizing opinions, like Menno doesn't believe in diet breaks. That's a very sort of superficial way to look at that statement. Um, and I'm Jackson, sure he's got his reasons. And Jackson supports yeah. diet breaks. But I'm sure once you sort of dig beyond that, and this is, you know, pretty important stuff for the listeners, and you look to the nuance, there'd be a lot more agreeance between uh, both of you than sort of what would meet the eye, you know, when you just sort of take these comments in isolation, you know, without any context um, mm. or further exploration, you know, of the of the reasons why those comments were made in the first place. So I think that could make for another useful podcast. We've got to get uh, you and Menno on to talk about diet breaks. That'd be cool. For sure, man. That'd be awesome. Easy. Well, Jackson, the people punching peacock, we call him Triple P here at JPS. He thinks he's a sushi eating god because he towed me and... Lin or you didn't tell Lyndon up, but you towed me up in a uh, sushi eating contest in Perth a few months back. Um, where can people find you? What can they do to help uh, further your research and support science? Um, best place to get me is um, Instagram. So anything I'm doing sort of in my lab, anything in regards to research, um, as well as sort of any research that's coming out unrelated to me that sort of in the nutritional scene I'll, I'll be posting about. So best place to keep up to date with me is there. That's just at Jackson Pios. Um, if you're a little bit more nerdy, um, my re formal research publications are on ResearchGate, just Jackson Pios again. Um, and in terms of contributions, um, like – at, as I said, the, the ATP science, it, it, um, sorry, uh, the, the supplement trial that we're, that we're planning to do at the moment or that we're proposing is, is in a crowdfunding stage. Um, if we can gather some more funds from that, it's going to bring a better trial and, and sort of um, I think it's going to be a really worthwhile investment if you are a consumer that cares about this sort of stuff um, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's going to encourage a lot more ethical practice um, from supplement companies when, when, we, when we start seeing um, things like this happen. Awesome, man. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for coming on and I'll uh, probably slide into your DMs in a couple of hours anyway and tease, Always you, a pleasure. tease you for something. <laughs> As usual. <laughs>